Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast, episode number 46 with Katie Oliveira. Um, fun conversation, learning more about her uh, unique journey and recent jump into uh, the entrepreneurial space uh, where she works to help college students make the most of their experience as they're uh, beginning uh, that journey or uh, throughout that time. So yeah, it's really a uh, really fun conversation. Appreciate uh, Katie's sort of uh, low-key uh, geekdom. Uh, you know, she sort of uh, alludes to that in the episode. Uh, and uh, we'll share out all the stuff that we talked about in this episode uh, down the show notes uh, as per usual. Um, and uh, we do have two uh, quick sponsor messages that you may have noticed. Um, so just definitely check out both of these great uh, organizations and resources and after this couple of brief messages, this is episode number 46 with Katie Oliveira. This episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast is brought to you by Top Hat, the teaching app that makes active learning come to life. Top Hat helps thousands of professors create their perfect course. Our app is easy to use and allows you to engage your class, adopt next generation textbooks, and run tests, all within a secure digital environment. See why faculty in over 700 colleges and universities across North America trust Top Hat to power their classrooms. Visit tophat.com slash geek. That's tophat.com slash geek. Longtime friend of the Higher Ed Geek podcast, Brian Leduc, has launched his latest project in the form of a course called Student Affairs Futures. Check out studentaffairsfutures.com for lifetime access to this growing resource on the impact of AI, changing demographics, and the future of work on the student affairs profession. Exclusively for listeners of the Higher Ed Geek podcast, he's offering a discount for the first 50 course enrollments. Use the promo code HigherEdGeek50, that's all one word, for 50% off the course. It's a $250 value and prepare your career for the emerging future of student affairs ahead. Yeah, I feel like it's ending up being like uh, almost like every other guest that I have lately is, uh, you know, they might do something else where they also are podcasting and just, you know, loving seeing uh, more people, especially in higher ed, uh, get into the podcasting game. And I think you're coming up on your like one year anniversary, um, just kicking off uh, season two of your show. So that's very exciting. It's so um, exciting. Yeah, I launched this podcast at the end of October last year and it's so interesting how it evolves and you go from kind of just like, what am I doing to like, Oh, people are listening. Like, Oh, now what? Mm. <laughs> you know, it's really exciting. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, like finding your voice, getting more confident, just like streamlining the process and just like, yeah, just people knowing it. And if you're like reaching out, they may be like, Oh, I know about that. Right. Listened or somebody told me about it, you know, like, yeah, yeah it's super cool. It's super uh, exciting. And you, you're right. You, you start to kind of get your voice and get your confidence. And you also start to kind of uh, take on that identity. I think it's a whole different uh, – it's, it's, it's got an identity onto itself. Yeah. Just like <laughs> taking up the mantle, you know, of podcaster. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about that and everything else that you're uh, getting into lately. But, um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and dive in if you just want to kick us off here and just give an introduction of yourself and, you know, just maybe a brief overview of your professional journey and how you got to be where you are today. Sure. So I'm Katie Oliveira. I am the host of the College of Advice podcast. I also teach, um, I'm an, well, I'm also an academic success coach and I, I teach American history and social justice as well. Yeah, very cool. It, yeah. Because uh, um, I think we share that as a, a background like I was a history major in undergrad so um yeah that kind of holds a special place in my heart that that's like part of the core of who you are as well <laughs> it is it is yeah. where a lot of my geekiness lies is in history um I I started off in higher head actually um it connected to that I went to grad school um got my master's degree in history with a complete and total intention of going on to becoming a history professor and while I was in grad school I um, had some personal things happen that required me to go from having that teaching teaching assistant income to having like a full time income, and so mm -hmm. I um, got the opportunity from one of my faculty members to become an academic coach and advisor in this program at the University of Houston called the the Scholars Community when I was 24 years old, where I 
um, supervised student mentors and tutors and worked one-on-one with students as an academic advisor, but also as an academic coach. And I loved it so much that I abandoned my dreams of becoming a history Mm. professor and decided I actually um, went and talked to my graduate advisors and talked to them about how I realized I need to be working one on one with students, not teaching and researching and being kind of an ivory tower. I needed to be in the mud with students and they were really supportive. And I actually um, moved my degree over to a uh, like a comprehensive exam instead of a thesis and just abandoned that road and went on to get a job as an advisor. And I've kind of been there ever since. I, I advise for um, a few years in, in you know universities in Houston, and then I advise for many, many years at my current university. I was an advisor. Then I got an opportunity to um, for a promotion as an a, a associate director, where I got to work as in the administrator level, re re vamping a department, revamping our orientation for new students along with some partners in student life and housing and had a really good experience. But when I got into that administrator role, I had the same experience I had as a student going on to get become a professor of like, I have managed to still got myself in a position where I'm not interacting with students. I'm not in the mud. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. And so I I decided that I needed to create something that was student centered. And so I um, left my position, my full time administrator position to teach and to start collegehood so that I was the center of my work was helping students get the most value Um, from their college experience, helping them to navigate it, helping them to understand who they are and where that fits in the context of the college experience and the game of college. And then also have the opportunity to teach some classes and stay rooted and connected to the university. So that's where I am today. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's like, it comes up a a lot with people I talk to of like, you know, there's like that core initially like we wanted to work with students in a teaching capacity but there's a lot of other stuff that comes with that and you know if that was sort of what was like turning you off but like you know that that desire still being sort of a through way and like you know you still are teaching you know and maybe not having to deal with as much of the other stuff that you might not like so it kind of worked out but also yeah just having that general you know north star guiding you of uh like you said just just wanting to help actively help students sort things out um and yeah, I mean, I've heard many stories just, you know, beyond the podcast of like, yeah, people who get to those points and, you know, make maybe a hard shift kind of lateral or a big change where they still want to uh, work with students more directly. And um, whether it's more immediate or longer term when they're away from that, it just, you know, um, yeah, to something kind of clicks eventually where they're like, you know what, I really do want to make that change and uh, go a different direction. So um, always fascinating to hear kind of uh, how people get to that point. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I found myself like uh, vicariously uh, working with students through the people I supervise, and I was like, "This is a problem." <laughs> you need to work with students. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, it's interesting. Yeah, and I mean, and it's good, I guess, at the very least. Like, eventually, you know, people realize that 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 is like a value of theirs and something that they really want to do. Um, and so, I guess, cause I, you know, it's really important. I think, and I appreciate that the higher ed is sort of kind of connecting with this, this idea a lot more of just like the value of coaches, you know, that person who's just there to check in with you and to help guide you and work through stuff um, and being more active in that approach versus passive and just kind of like, you know, we build it and they will come if they want to. And if not, then that's their problem kind of thing. It's like, you mm-hmm. know, really engaging people in an active way to, you know, help them, you know, kind of just uh, navigate the, uh, you know, kind of maze of uh, modern higher education just between like, just, you know, knowing what resources are there, how to access them and, you know, what you should really do to like organize your time and make sure that you're you know moving in a good way towards your goals. Um, but I'm curious, you know, for your own college experience, did you have somebody that was like a good role model for you in that way? Or was it like sort of the, I feel like a lot of times it's, you know, we get to points for, you know, one side of the coin or the other, like you had somebody who was a role model and inspired you, or you're like, I wish I had this when I was in college. So I want to give it to other people. So, you know, anything like that, I guess, anything just in general that kind of resonates for you from your, your own college experience that, you know, you still kind of bring with you either personally and or professionally. Oh, my own college experience, I, quite frankly, to extend it, my, my own like late adolescent, early young adult experience is 
always present when I'm thinking about the work I do. Um, I was a first generation college student and my parents, my parents, my dad got a GED and are both working class people. Um, first in my family to go on in like a traditional college path. And Mm -hmm. so in my extended family as well. And so, um, when I went off to college, my parents were kind of like, we love you, gave me a hug and kind of dropped me up, you know, walked me up to my room, gave me a hug and set me off on my own where like I'm looking over at my roommate's parents who are helping her set up her room and taking her to dinner. And I'm like, where, where did my parents, they just didn't know, you mm-hmm. know, they, they were doing what they thought and they, and they were supportive, but I kind of went in blind. I, I, I went to, um, Baylor University as a first generation working class kid. Um, I wanted to be a science major and I was surrounded by students who not all, but by and large came from college educated professional homes. Right. And so they kind of knew what to expect. I didn't have those transitional support mechanisms. Like I designed in my role at my university, um, in my role at, um, my university as the associate director. I mean, that's what I created was essentially a holistic office that helps students transition. I had good mentors though. I had people that cared about me academically and that invested in me and showed me that I was bright and capable and had potential, even if they weren't speaking directly, you know, with college development type support that you see in modern Mm -hmm. universities provide in their programming. They were totally there to guide me. They saw I had potential and they saw I was a bit of a fish out of water. But those came primarily in the form of, of faculty advisors, not professional advising staff. Now, I since think they've moved to that as a lot of universities have um, as the demand on faculty shifts. I think a lot of schools, some schools are amplifying that role and some schools are diminishing it. But um, I was lucky to have good faculty advisors who at the very least could shape me as a scholar and help me persist through the college experience, even though I often had that thought running through my mind of, I don't think I belong here. I went, I considered transferring. I looked into that. It was going to transfer schools between my freshman and sophomore year, as many do. And it was going to be expensive and I was going to lose a bunch of credits and it just seemed so overwhelming. Um, and I persevered through that and stuck it out. And I think I, I am better for it. And I think that that experience, I still feel what it felt like to be a lost freshman. (laughs) And so I think, and then to feel what it felt like to be a a senior who's kind of figured it out. And and that experience stays really fresh in my mind. And I think it's part of what drives me to help others with, with this experience that can be kind of murky and hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, cause yeah, it's just like, there's so much value. And like I was saying, just like somebody looking out for you and doing that, like once you're in college, but you know, there is so much that you can do to like kind of soften the landing and just make sure, you know, you're well prepared going in. Like you said, you kind of just were like dropped off and like, you know, yeah, a lot of students, you you don't know, you don't know. And, you know, only after maybe you like have, uh, you know, some sort of shipwreck moment or, you know, some sort of pitfall, like that's when you maybe try to seek out help. But yeah, like if you have a hardship, you just transfer, you just quit, you, you know, anything like that. So, um, yeah, it's good this like being able to get yourself back into that emotional place of, you know, kind of at best just sort of like, you know, confusion or, you know, just kind of blindness. But then like, yeah, like you'd want somebody like to feel confident going in and everything, you know, goes as according to plan as it can. You know, life is, you know, can be unpredictable. But um, yeah, just like, you know, knowing what that felt like, wanting to help other people as much as you can. And um, yeah, I think unfortunately you know, a lot of colleges don't make it as easy as they should. So, you know, uh, just doing what you can to, uh, you know, get one as well prepared and know like the right questions to ask and all that. Cause I think just, you know, transitioning to like what you're doing now, like helping people kind of sort out all that stuff, you know, it can be valuable. I think having kind of a broader perspective versus obviously somebody would end up having to talk with somebody at the particular place that they're going to in terms of like the higher institution. But you know, just in terms of like, yeah, like asking the right questions or knowing kind of generally what, you know, people might do in a given situation when they're going to college and might have some sort of problem or question, you know, that could be valuable as well. Just like thinking outside the box versus like trying to fit within like a particular paradigm to, um, you know, figure out some problem with 
going going to college they might need to get that assistance with so yeah you're doing this you know really valuable work um with collegehood so you're kind of doing your own thing and you know still tethered to you know formal higher ed through your teaching and everything and you know are also you know you're hosting and producing your own podcast which is super cool um so kind of with all of that different stuff that you're doing right now you know what do you enjoy most about it um if it's you know all different stuff that helps keep you engaged or you know just being your own boss and that you know that flexibility um you know what what's keeping you really excited about the current work that you're doing now obviously like i know it just kind of personally resonates with you and if that's you know kind of the engine that keeps you going but uh yeah anything else that might come to mind yeah, I think last year when I made the choice, and it was not an easy choice because I was part of my university community for a really long time and was also really integral to a lot of the culture and programs of the university. I sat at the tables where a lot of those things were designed. Um, but when I made that decision, it was that decision to um, be able to help in a more general way and to be able to help all students, even those in the middle who weren't at risk or who weren't high flyers. I think sometimes the resources of the university are scarce and our human resources are are often overtaxed. And so we have to prioritize outreach. And I wanted to help students in the middle in an unbiased way. I wanted to, my goal is to empower them to be able to navigate systems and ask questions and believe in themselves and to dispel mythology so that they could kind of harness the experience of college and do something with it. And so when I left the position that I was kind of excited, but terrified, like, oh my gosh, this is going to be awesome. Oh my gosh, what have I done? And it took me a while to go from a higher ed professional with a formal, you know, eight to six some days um, schedule where I'm supervising people and I'm in and out in meetings and have a very, very highly structured environment to um, having a, a, a life that I am the one who's sort of dictating the structure. And so initially, I think the idea of like not having a boss and starting your own thing and then the romantic, you know, idealistic um a magical things that go mm. with that was where I was thinking. And then very soon, a few months in, I had like that bit of a crisis. I got, I actually got really, really sick. I got pneumonia and I was still teaching. So I had to actually take a week off of school and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't have sick days. Oh my gosh, I don't have a sub. What do I do? What have I done? You know, you start to question your choice and I think you have to push through that. And just on the other side of that is the magic, you know, of like, okay, I can do this and I've just got to put one foot in front of the other and I'm going to get momentum. And I, I think I'm still doing that. If you would have told me a year ago that I would be where I am today and it's still modest gains, but it's gains, you know, I'm getting, Mm -hmm. you know, I've gotten, um, you know, I think since the podcast, you know, several thousand of downloads and I'm working with students and I'm partnering with um, different organizations and I'm on this podcast. If you would have told me that this time last year, I would have been like, whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I'd be like, I might be reapplying for my job, <laughs> you know? Um, but now I see the potential. I, I see how much potential there is to bring a message that's authentic and honest and I'm just being me and trying to get this information out there resonates with people and how needed it is and how important it is and how much just having a voice kind of reiterating, reinforcing, encouraging is really powerful. And I look forward to that. I look forward to kind of growing the reach of the podcast, um, eventually being able to offer some services and, and, resources in that way that, you know, once I have the time to start to develop some of that, um, once I feel like the podcast is going to have its momentum, I think that that's really, um, a special opportunity. Um, and I think now it's about like last year it was, Oh, do I have something? And this year it's, I have something, what do I do with it? And, um, so I'm excited to see what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's something that I, I think about a lot. Yeah. It's just that like, because a lot of people talk about it, you know, there's just this like magical allure of like entrepreneurship and just like, you know, it just will we'll solve all your problems. And it's like, like, yes, maybe it's also hard. And yeah, like it's going to take time and consistency and all that. And like, 
you know, we just have these stories that we tell ourselves and, you know, we see that are kind of exceptions to the role of like something that's an overnight success and, you know, explosive growth and all that. And it's like, there's a lot of people doing their own things and it's going to be slow and steady. And it's just a matter mm-hmm. of that commitment and everything. And, you know, yeah, finding the milestones to celebrate and, um, you know, yeah, just like trying things, seeing what sticks and all that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I can, I can only imagine, yeah, because I, I know a lot of people who are either kind of working on and doing that or doing that. And like, you know, it's been varying dif- different amount of times that they've been on that journey. Um, so it's always fascinating to see kind of the, um, you know, the triumphs and struggles and all that. But yeah, you've got that kind of that motivation, um, knowing that you're doing good work that that's benefiting people and seeing that traction. Um, but I guess, you know, can I interject really fast? Oh, go for it. Yeah. Next <laughs> okay. Well, what brought to my mind was, yeah, it's really hard. Everything you see, the podcast, everything, the notes, the website, like the social media, the, the resources, everything is me. Every, you know, I, my husband helps with some editing, but everything is you and you have to learn how to do all of that. I'm a higher ed professional and a history major who's been trained to research and write and coach students in an academic environment. I'm not a marketer. I'm not a sound person. Like I'm not, I'm not a techie person. I had to, I have to learn those skills. And I think too, there's something very important. And I share this with my students a lot. I think there is something very important in small success that we forget in this time of like amazing, big celebrity level success that you're helping people. If you're helping, if I was, I often, when I get like, um, when my brain starts going down a darker path of like, what have you done? You're not helping millions of people kind of a place. I start to think if I had a brick and mortar in a, in a small town, um, that was like a respectable little brick and mortar business, I would be like over the moon to have as many people tuning into the podcast, um, as I do, you know what I mean? And so Uh I keep that as a way of like checking yourself in that, um, you can broadcast your voice over the internet and hundreds, maybe thousands of people can hear you and what you're saying. And that's amazing, um, and special and should be respected. And those little, um, like you're saying, celebrating those little successes and giving yourself compassion and space to grow in an organic way, I think is super important to this kind of endeavor. Mm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. All uh, powerful stuff, good tips. And I think, yeah, it can be fun learning those new things. Again, it can be difficult because you might, you know, like you're banging your head against the wall. Like, you know, sometimes people are like with audio stuff. Cause yeah, like I had to teach myself how to do this. And I'm also still not an expert cause I can't give, you know, it's not like my full-time job to do it, but you know, getting at least to like the adept point of being able to do it, you know, some level of quality. And, um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing this now for like over four years, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of different facets like that, but it's like, yeah, sometimes that's part of that whole confidence building is like, some problem pops up or a new challenge and you're able to figure it out, you know, and it's just like, Oh, okay. Well, you know, I was able to figure out those 10 other things. Now oh, here's number 11. Oh, you know, I was able to figure it out. And, you know, again, sometimes it takes, you know, time or effort or, you know, you bring somebody else in or get advice, you know, you always have to figure things out on your own, but always a lot of great resources for any number of things too. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's good, good, just life lessons. And, you know, yeah, it could be, you know, because it's like, that's what I see sometimes, you know, if it's ever anybody's original goal, sometimes it kind of is, which is, you know, I'm kind of like, Ugh. but, you know, if you build something, just trying to almost like get bought out and then you just go back to like a traditional job, it was like, yeah, I mean, it was a roller coaster ride and I learned a lot and it was great. And then I just like sold it off and stopped doing it. And then I'm just like back to kind of doing what I was doing before or something. Or it could be like, yeah, you grow it into more than you've ever could have imagined and you just keep learning new things and, it, you know, whatever. But, it's, yeah, and I think that the one of the first things you mentioned, though, of just kind of like almost just like always forward, like one step at a time and not, you know, because I think, yeah, if you're being like hard on yourself, you're like, why isn't growing quicker? I should be doing more like I shouldn't be taking a break. Like, you know, I can't treat myself. You know, it's just like that's, you know, you're going to be too harsh on yourself. But yeah, like I'm, I'm huge. I'm like just celebrating those like small wins and milestones and um, 
yeah, just kind of like, you know, motivating yourself with like, you know, taking a break, taking a trip, like, you know, doing some things. It's just like, you know, yeah, you, uh, it could be, I can imagine it could be hard for people to allow for themselves to like, you know, be kind to themselves, you know, because they just feel like, right. yeah, it's like, no, I can't stop. I can't stop. Um, <laughs> but I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, in that kind of vein, like, you know, if you were to like treat yourself, I don't know if, if, if you kind of go in on like being like a history nerd, you know, w- with that kind of part of your background, but you know, like, what are you geeking out about right now? Or if it's stuff that's kind of like adjacent or related to, um, you know, the work that you're doing or being like an entrepreneur, but, um, yeah, just kind of what's, what's generally, you know, grabbing your attention when you, what are you geeking out about? <laughs> I am like, uh, one of these people who seems like they're, you know, I live, live in a hip city. I have really hip friends. I can pass, but I'm really geeky about a lot of things. <laughs> like I am an academic, like intellectual analyzer to my core. <laughs> um, and so I geek out about a lot of stuff. I love history and politics and that kind of thing. And it's an interesting time. So I, of course, geek out there. I also really love nature and I am obsessed with butterflies, <laughs> which is really bizarre. And everybody who knows me is like, what? So we will plant <laughs> Like my daughter, I have a daughter and, and she and I planted all of these native plants that um, that attract butterflies. And we have had multiple caterpillars um, out there and we've watched them make chrysalises. Now, it's really sad to try to raise caterpillars out in your backyard. There are a lot of predators and things that go wrong and it's heartbreaking. And I've learned that this year, but it's really cool to watch the whole process. And I just love attracting them to the garden. So I'm a total geek about that. Um, I love cooking and food and health. And I spend a lot of time doing things like yoga and learning how to cook from scratch. And I subscribe to community supported agriculture and I garden and I try to grow my own food and learning, always learning how to cook. And so that's how I live. Like I want to live, um, like cooking really good food with really fun people and spending time in a garden and playing and hanging out and just existing with those like simple pleasures of, you know, sitting out in a picnic table with like twinkly lights above having a really good meal. That's what I geek out about. <laughs> mm. And it sounds like a, a fair amount of like hands on stuff, which I, I, I yes. tend to see a lot with people who like, you know, if, yeah, if like, a, like a history nerd or, you know, and the work that you do is obviously just like, you know, all kind of like tech web based kind of stuff, you know, mm-hmm. obviously working with people, but you know, I, a big piece of advice. Cause I, I just remember like when people are in school and, you know, you can always kind of have the excuse, like you don't have the time, like people that just like, they're like, I don't know what my hobbies are. Like, I don't have any hobbies. And it's like, yeah, like I, and it's a big part of the show is like highlighting those things that people do as like a creative hobby or, you know, like stuff with your hands. Cause some people it is like, Oh, I write, I paint, you know, I, I sculpt things or something, you know, a lot of people it's like, Oh, I woodwork. I, yeah, I cook, I garden or, you know, just build stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's like, those are really, I think necessary in one way or another, mm-hmm. you know, even if it's like, Oh, I geek out about working out, you know, like I really get into the gear and like, you know, uh, doing whatever, you know, running, you know, doing races, but it's just like any of those hobbies help kind of nourish and kind of, uh, cultivate energy in us for us to be able to kind of bring our best selves to the other things that you might have a creative epiphany while you're cooking or, you know, like, or you're gardening. Cause sometimes it's like in certain ways you might be doing something like over and over and over again. And it's like, like, yeah, you kind of have to like let yourself be bored, you know, or like, you know, if you're just like making something from scratch, it might just be like, yep, I got to like mix all this stuff up for a while. And then like, (laughs) it's like, Oh, I just had this idea for a thing I could do, you know, like, um, yeah, um, it lets you take your brain offline and you're exactly right. If I, when I'm going to make an awesome retired person one day, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> this idea of I sell my business and I go back to a, a job, that sounds nuts. It would be I sell my business and I like knit and then I cook and then I garden and then I go to yoga. <laughs> like I could do hobbies, active hobbies all day. And it's funny that you say that because I think you're right. Like after using your mind all day, creating content, um, producing content, doing web stuff, doing tech stuff, um, working with people in a str- with with a uh, strategy in, in mind i think being really strategic and kind of helping people take their um next best steps and stuff is also really um analytical brain work right and then you know at the end of the day i i, I just want to cook a really nice meal or go for a really nice run or go to a yoga class or 
play a game with my kids. I don't want to, I I'm really actually terrible at, um, reading books. I read, I read books. I read a ton of books, but my friends so desperately want me to be in like a fiction book club. And, and I'm like, I, I can't, I know that seems weird. Like I should be a person who can do book club, but I think because I read and write for a lot of the day, I just have no desire to do a book club for my activity. <laughs> I would much yeah. rather go to a yoga class with you. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 You end up having to like schedule time for like a task of just like, well, I have to read this book. So I need to like, you know, yes. and, um, when I can also appreciate, cause I, I feel like I observe this sometimes with people of how you kind of, what I call you are like kind of low key nerdy or geeky, whatever, you know, whatever word you mm -hmm. want to use. But like, there's some people I know where like, yeah, you meet them and you kind of like interact, but then like, I'll see they post on social media about going to like some convention or something. And they're like, they have this whole amazing cosplay thing. And it's the idea of like, okay, you paid for like a flight, a ticket to this convention. You have this amazing cosplay and all that. It's like, you are like low key, like hardcore geeky, nerdy, <laughs> whatever. And like, you know, some people it's just like, you know, cause they'll like go out into the world and they've got like tattoos and their shirt. And like, they just talk about it all the time of like loving star Wars or something. And other people, it's just like, yeah, it's like, two or three layers beneath that if you like crack into it it's just like it just erupts and it's just like oh my gosh i read this like biography of this like historical figure so you know like yeah just like they'll like tell you the whole you know the whole story or something but um yeah, yeah. nobody i know wants me to point out a monarch butterfly to them and tell them all about them and how we need to save them they're always like okay katie <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like, enough, enough with the monarch butterflies. Enough. We know. I guess I watched the flight of the monarchs or whatever that that flight of the butterflies. I watched it. Don't tell me anything else. Yeah. Oh man, um, that's great. Um, well, I guess anything like um, else in terms of like your your hobbies or um, is there anything with those that you'd want to like specifically mention that you're like reading, watching, listening to, or anything like that? But just like. Yeah, anything that you'd want to mention, um, yeah. that we can include in the show notes, and just like how that all kind of like positively contributes. Just to, to I think we kind of like alluded to it, but any like anecdotes maybe of like building community around, you know, anything things that you're into, or if like they've been part of your lives for like a long, long time, or anything like that. Yeah, I um, well, I live, you know, I live in Austin, so this is the music town, and I love music. I love going to shows. In the last years, I've kind of fallen out of listening to music as much because I listen to so many podcasts. Mm. <laughs> I found myself actively choosing to, to be like, okay, I've listened to a lot of podcasts. I need to listen to some music. And I like sort of indie rock, alternative rock music. Um, I'm a child of the nineties. So my favorite band ever of all time is Radiohead. I love them so very much. Mm. And, um, I, so I, I, I listen to a lot of music, but I am gotten really bad about it because I listen to so many podcasts. A lot of the podcasts I listen to I actually listen to a lot of kids podcasts because I'm with my kids a lot. And so, um, we love things like wow in the world is fantastic. I love it. But I listen to things like, um, a lot of business podcasts, a lot of podcasts about spirituality, a lot about history and government. So I love, um, the Washington post did this great one called constitutional. Have you, have you, uh, listened to that one? I've, I've not even heard of it and I'm curious. Oh, it's so good. So I, in the spring semester, usually I teach history. I teach an American history class and I teach it from the perspective of, um, at, what does liberty mean and how does that meaning of liberty and freedom change and evolve over the course of American history to allow more and more people to access it? And how do those people use their agency to sort of access that liberty? And so we talk a lot about the Constitution. We talk a lot about the founding fathers and like what was intended. And they this podcast is fantastic because it essentially goes through every single aspect of the Constitution, preamble, to each and every amendment and sort of the backstory, the history of it, what it means. They have legal scholars come and talk about it. It's great. And so it's a really good comprehensive piece on, and it's kind of a serial style um, podcast that you can listen to, you know, you would listen to the whole uh, project all the way through. Um, and it's, 
it's just great. It's a, it's one of my favorites. Um, so I love podcasts like that. Like I like revisionist history, Malcolm Gladwell's um, mm-hmm. ones that I that help me kind of think through history in a different ways. And they are in, really inspirational for me to think about how to have conversations with students about history and current politics and social justice issues in a way that's accessible and that's not polarizing or divisive that's productive and com- compassion based and I found it to be super helpful and then I listen to like um a lot I I read I read a lot I'm obsessed if I could go back in time and um get a PhD I think I'd get it in neuroscience like I'm obsessed with brain science I love reading about the adolescent brain I'm currently reading a book called the um the teenage brain. I just read one called Inventing Ourselves. There's so much new research about the de- brain development with in the last 10 or 15 years um, that explains so much uh, misunderstood adolescent and young adult behavior. And I just love it. I think it's super important. Um, so I spent a lot of time reading on that. And, um, you know, I like to watch Netflix. I'm obsessed with like the chef's table and those kind of <laughs> those mm. kind of shows on Netflix. I can watch anytime someone's sick in my house. We watch the British Baking Show. My kids know they'll be like, "I don't feel good, mommy. We need to put on the British Baking Show." <laughs> I feel like it's like like the new like true crime stuff is like just pleasant, heartwarming cooking shows or something. Like there's just going to be like more and more of them. And I'm like, you know what? That maybe that's where we are right now. We we need yeah, that's just what we like need. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I need man. a nice escape. I can't do anything like that. I can't do any crime, any suspense, any scary. I need good old, like, mm, that is beautiful. I want to go there. I want to eat that kind of things. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I, I think we've, you know, like, especially with like the superhero genre, we've kind of like gotten away from that. Um, especially as like the majority, they'll do something every once in a while, but just like, like, I think we've been like gritty enough for long enough in our like media and entertainment. Like, it's like, we could certainly have that in the mix, but uh, you know, let's keep it, uh, keep it light, keep it fun, keep it, you know, just a little bit more pleasant. Um, <laughs> it's just my point of view. Um, Mine too. I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that. I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah. need to feel artificially stressed out and scared. I need to save that for when I need it. Yeah. Like you could like, <laughs> yeah, strategically choose the like one out of five movies versus just like, no, like four out of five of them are all just like gritty reboots of like, you know, <laughs> care bears or something. It's just like, yeah, it's just like, everything's going to be like real, you know, like, um, <laughs> So, yeah, it's like a soapbox. Yeah, because like I love like movies and TV, and you know, I just like read about the behind the scenes and production and like the box office and like just critical analysis of you know uh, our our media. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of good podcasts. We'll link out to all those, and um, and it's cool too. It's something that you like, you know, share with your kids too, and. Um, I think it, it would have been funny if it's like, like, yeah, I don't listen to music as much anymore. I listen to a lot of podcasts about music, about like the music that I used to listen. Like it would have been funny if it was like you had this epiphany on the show. I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't listen to music, but I listen to like podcasts about music. Maybe um, I should do that. That's a good idea. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, but it's the whole thing too of like, do you listen to the stuff that you know you like or do you listen to like new stuff? And it's like I end up, yeah, either just like throwing some random Spotify playlists on for whatever mood I'm in or like seeking out the things that I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just put on Spotify playlists. Now I have no, I have no personal choice in my music anymore. I just listen to what Spotify tells me to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, yeah. Like based on, (laughs) yeah. I mean, and it's a whole thing. I think that, uh, that at least is better in the sense of like, I think some people generally bemoan the like loss of like discoverability (laughs) of things. Like, you know, all the algorithms do recommend things, but they're probably going to be similar to what we already like, but you know, a good right. Spotify playlist could introduce some cool things, you know. That's like a, I think that's a good avenue for that. Um, yeah. But uh, so yeah, and I think you know, seeing just how all those things can kind of benefit you, you know, if it's like giving you some ideas or resources in terms of your teaching or just like personal fulfillment, enjoyment, or you know, uh, yeah, sharing things with your your kids. So, um, and I guess yeah, that's stuff kind of across the board that you're engaging in. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, just to wrap up the episode on the optimistic note as we're kind of getting to, just like, you know, good feelings here. Um, if you, you know, any or all of these kind of categories here, um, what is something or things that you are looking forward to in your job, life, and or the world? I'm really looking forward to seeing where 
this adventure takes me. I know that's kind of a generic general answer, but that's really where I am. I am an optimist. I am a person who has great um, comfort in the present. I don't I don't focus too much on the future, the too far out in the future. So there's questions like, what is your next five year goals or 10 years goals? I was always a person like, I don't know. I know I want to do this now and I want to see where that takes me. And so that's what I'm looking forward to. I think I'm in a really fun moment where I'm excited to see where I go in the next year. I feel like I've come so far and I've, um, connected with so many people from across the country I never thought I would connect with. I think I have starting to resonate and gain traction and I would love to see where that continues to take me. And so I'm just excited for the opportunity to, to make stuff and have people hear it and, and see where that takes me and just live life and, um, have flexibility and and freedom to do these kinds of things. And and I think that that's kind of amazing and magical. I have a lot of gratitude for just that simple um, way of being. Yeah. Just kind of going along for the ride and seeing, uh, seeing where the wind takes you. And I think, yeah. Yeah. Strategically with intention, but, but without, I'm more, I focus more on process than outcome. And I think that that helps you um, not miss opportunities that present themselves. And for me, it's like being optimistic about the future of like being able to handle any challenges or think that things will work out or, you know, the kind of life generally in the world is kind of, you know, always going to improve. That's, you know, just what kind of <laughs> like the thing I have to tell myself to keep moving, but it's like, you know, just yeah, believing in the potential of the future and your ability to kind of uh, persevere and push on, but then, yeah, not getting too distracted by kind of 12 steps ahead of you. It's like, no, you know, I got to, Kind of keep moving forward and keep incrementally kind of continuously improving. And, um, yeah, well, we, yeah, I think, you know, that's, it's a good piece of advice there, just in the simplest sense. And, you know, I've heard this kind of resonate and kind of translate in a lot of different capacities. It's like you have to fall in love with the process kind of thing, you know, like you, you can't get too caught up in the kind of bright, shiny thing and, you know, kind of reaching and grasping for that. It's like, you know, yeah, you've got to kind of day in, day out, kind of be consistent and commit to it. Um, and yeah, do it with strategy, do it with intention and, um, with care. And, uh, <laughs> there's so many aspects. Yeah. Cause it's like, you don't want to ever want to put too much of a, a structure or a formula on things because if it doesn't work out exactly as you imagined, it's like, you know, you don't want to, um, kind of put all your uh, eggs in one basket, I guess. But, um, yeah. And just being like kind of comfortable with that ambiguity to a certain extent and just being flexible and adaptive. And, um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're, you know, in a good place or a better place of not, uh, you know, questioning everything. It's just like, you know, again, just yeah, being comfortable with the ambiguity and just moving forward and uh, being excited about that journey. So, um, yeah, I wish you the best and uh, keep on it with the uh, with the podcast and uh, doing the great stuff there. And um, yeah, I appreciate your time and all that you've shared uh, on this podcast here. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been lovely to chat with you. This podcast is part of the Connect EDU podcast network, bringing together diverse voices in the higher ed community. Check us out on Twitter at ConnectEDUPod or at ConnectEDU.network. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.